بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وخاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعن الله الدائم على أعدائهم أجمعين من ليلتنا هذه إلى قيام يوم الدين Respected elders and brothers and sisters in Islam and Iman We've gathered here and we're honored to be present at a majlis for Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam It's also the very special night of Thursday a night of blessings, a night of Remembering the Imam of our time, our night of doing ziyara of Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam, in order to attract the special mercy of Allah Ta'ala to this gathering, I would invite you to recite a united, beautiful salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The question that I posed to you and myself yesterday was a very important question. And ho I hope that, just like for me, it was a means for you to think and to ponder. And to ask yourself this fundamental question that if I have a purpose for which I've been created, how much of my time do I spend actively pursuing this purpose? And this question is related to the main reason why we found people not in support of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. We gave an example last night, I want to give another one tonight. There were two friends, one by the name of al dahaq ibn Abdullah, and the other one, his name was Malik ibn an nadr Malik and al dahaq met Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam on the way to Karbala. He invites them to join him. Malik says to him that I have some debts that I have to pay and some affairs with family that I have to attend to, so I'll excuse myself from participating and joining you. But Abdul Haq has a different approach. He says that I have some debts and I have some family matters to attend to as well, but I'll make a deal with you. I'll join you, and while I find that I'm of assistance to you, I can support you, and I'll be there with you. But when I find, and if I find, that it gets to the point where my life will be in stake, then I'll excuse myself at that point. And Imam al Islam agreed. <clears throat> On the day of Ashura, we find that Abdul Haq is with the Imam salam. He's fighting, he kills several of the enemy soldiers. He even participates in the last salah at Dhuhr time. But when he sees that one by one, the companions begin to be martyred. He goes, he goes to his master, Imam Hussain alayhi salam, and he says that, do you remember how we had this discussion and you promised to me that at that time I could leave? Imam alayhi salam says, yes. Do you give me permission to leave? Go ahead, I don't know, how will you do it though, the enemy is on. He says, no. I've hid my horse in a tent. I will find my horse and I will escape the enemy. And that's exactly what he does. And al dahaq goes on to be one of the narrators of what took place in the events of Karbala. When we look at these two individuals, we look at it and we say that from the outsider perspective that how could you? Your Imam, the center of your existence, 
the means by which Allah has provided you and continues to provide you with all your blessings, the one who is ulul amr is alone and you're abandoning him? But you see, brothers and sisters, when somebody has an idol that they bow to, an idol that they cherish and covet and they feed and they sacrifice towards, then when they are tested, it's those loyalties which are going to determine what type of decision they're going to make. And the idol that we're talking about is the idol, the biggest idol of all, which is the idol of self. Now, the problem that we have in this society, and the reason why I gave examples like Steve Jobs, is that we're told that what it means to be successful is to be somebody who is able to get as much of the dunya as possible. <coughs> And when somebody becomes infatuated with the dunya, they do so because of the type of pleasures that they enjoy for themselves. They start to gain status among people. That's something that pleases ourselves. This, people start to look up to them and follow them. We like this idea of riasa and being able to tell people what to do. We start to, when we get more of the dunya, we start to be able to appeal to our lusts in a more finer and more sophisticated way. Before, I would just settle for the normal type of fare. But now I can look for more exquisite cuisine. I'll drive even further to find you know, those special type of ingredients that will appeal to my palate. Different types of opportunities for luxury and whatnot start to appear to us. And we're told that this is as if what we're being created for. And we have to look at this and be very scared of it. Allah Ta'ala gives us the example of Qarun. Yesterday I mentioned him. Today I wanted to read the verses about him as an introduction to the topic. Allah Ta'ala describes the story of Qarun in Surah Al-Qasa, Surah number 28 of the Qur'an, where he says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن قارون كان من قوم موسى فبغى عليهم Qarun was from the people of Musa, but he became somebody who was a tyrant. We gave him so much treasures that the keys would weigh down a strong company of men. And his people started complaining. And they said that, okay, don't enjoy the dunya so much. It's not meant for this. Use what Allah has given you as a means of attaining the akhirah. Don't forget about the dunya. That's, of course, you still have to attend to like your worldly affairs. And then they say to him, Do good the way that Allah has done good to you. Don't seek to corrupt and don't seek corruption in the earth because Allah does not love those who are the corrupt. Now, the next verse, which is um, verse number 78, uh, 78 of Surah Al-Qasas, it's a very key point that we have to realize, especially living in this society, it's something we have to really ponder upon. What was Qarun's justification for being somebody who was worshipping the dunya and by that way he was also worshipping the idol of self? He has a reason for it. What does he say? قَالَ إِنَّمَا أُوْتِيْتُهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ عِنْدِي I was given this because of knowledge that I have. What is Qarun's fundamental problem? Qarun's fundamental problem is that he has seen himself as the reason for his worldly success. Now brothers and sisters, ask yourselves this question. What typically happens when somebody gains knowledge. They start getting degree after degree after degree. When they get status after status after status, sometimes even when it comes to religious degrees, you see this happening. Typically what happens, and of course we have exceptions of people who become more humble the more knowledge they get, but typically what happens is that this becomes a means of them feeling like they are gaining success. They feel happy about it they begin to exalt and they start to see themselves as something. 
they start to attribute their success to themselves. But what I want to ask you tonight, to, the question I have for you and myself tonight is this question, which is related to the question that we asked yesterday, which was that let's look at ourselves and let's look at what Allah has done for us. Let's look and see how is it that He has arranged things for us to be able to provide us with a means for attaining our purpose. And the question is this, that let's say that you were given one hour to live. Okay, that's it. They told you something happened. You went to the doctor. They said, that, oh, you have a major issue. And you have one hour to live. Okay, put yourself in that situation. Ask yourself this question. That what is it that you would be upset about not attaining? Meaning that everyone has some type of success that they want to achieve. What would be the thing that would really be something that would be disappointing to you? That you'd be like, if I didn't get this by that time, then I would consider myself as a failure. Is it the type of success that the likes of Steve Jobs and celebrities and CEOs that they talk about? Or is it something deeper than that? <inaudible> this is the slogan for somebody who sees themselves as responsible for their own success. But I want to step back now and try to ponder things with a more Tawhidi perspective. A more a perspective of trying to see what Allah has done for us. I want to start out with the basics. We as human beings, I want to look at the system by which Allah makes us successful. Not how we sometimes imagine that we're successful. So number one, human beings are created in a way that they don't have everything that they need with them. Right? From the time we're born to the time we die, Everything that we need is not packaged along with ourselves. In fact, there's a lot of stuff that we don't have. Whether it be the air that we have to breathe, whether it be the milk that we are given from the time we're born, whether it be the care that we're given from those who love us, to ila mashallah, so many things. So Allah has created us in a way that we do not have what we need, but at the same time, He's given us a system by which He provides those things that we do need. Now how has He provided us with those things that we do need? Sometimes we need to go back to the basics and ponder and think. How has He provided us with this, what we, what we call risk, meaning that which takes care of our need? There are two ways. Sometimes it's in a way where something is ready to go. You go outside, you walk around, you see an apple on a tree, you can pick that. You go fishing in the or you, you know, you see a fish on, you know, just swimming, you grab it and you can eat it. You can, many different things are just there. A, a baby who is born has a means provided right there from his or her mother. And some of them require some type of work in order for us to achieve that. The hunters need to have some sort of means of being able to track down the animal and take it down. If you go into the animal kingdom, it's the same thing. How Allah Ta'ala has created them, but a lot of times He doesn't give them their risk with them, they have to find them. And it's something which, you know, if you look at it from a certain perspective, you start to appreciate what Allah has done for us. I was watching something about different types of fishes. I don't know if you've seen this clip recently, it was out. They were showing like this fish, you know, usually you think of like, okay, well, um, what is it that eats fishes, right? You say, okay, well, fishes are eaten by, let's say, I don't know, other fishes which are bigger than them. Or you say that, okay, if, um, you know, fishes are sometimes eaten by birds that are flying in the sky or bears that are there next to them. You know, different human beings eat fish, right? But have you ever heard of a fish that eats birds? Right? Normally, you don't think about a fish eating birds. It's usually the other way around. But they were showing this, right, that you have fish, which are like massive fish, Right? They have been given the capacity to be able to track birds that are flying above them in the sky. They know how to track their altitude and their velocity and the direction that they're moving. And right at a certain time, they can leap into the air and grab the bird that's flying above them and they can eat it. What do you say about that? Right? Like Who put that system into place? You have other fish which... You know, the archer fish where 
with water that they spit out of their mouth, they, can, they figured out, Allah has taught them how they can target insects and, and different small flying things that are flying in the air. They can target it, spit with their, their, the, the water and they can, it falls down and they go and eat it. Right? Every being has been given not only that need but the way that that need is taken. And different means for being able to go and attract that need to themselves, being able to attain that need for themselves. It doesn't just stop there, brothers and sisters. When you go deeper and deeper, we start to see more of the wonder in the system that Allah has created to make us successful. We have that need, and then we have the thing that provides that need, and there's an attraction between us and that thing as well too. Where does that come from? Who taught us how to be hungry? Who taught us how to be thirsty? Who taught us the need to have love? These are things which are not taught. They're put in us from the time we're born. If we didn't have them, then we wouldn't be able to even go for that risk that Allah has, the provisions which Allah has given to us. But that's there as well. It doesn't just stop there. The, Allah has given us means for not only having that attraction to it, but also once we get it, to be able to process it as well. Imagine that we had that hunger, we got to the food, and then we didn't know what to do with it. It doesn't just stop there. Right? Now, this is, I'm not talking about brothers and sisters like you know, one of those documentaries that you watch where they start you know, kind of like showing that, oh, there's this thing and that, and you know, you know, look at this animal going from here to here. Those things, they, they just look at the very surface level of it. Right? We're looking at it from the perspective of who's really doing this. How did the system come into place? Look at, for example, our, our body. When we put something in our mouth, what happens to that thing? Have you ever thought about this? You know, in a very high-level, unscientific explanation of it, you put food in your mouth. As soon as you put it in your mouth, the process of a, a digestion, digestion begins. That liquid saliva that's in our mouth has that capacity to be able to start breaking it down from that point. Sometimes you wonder why is it that, you know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi has given us so many prescriptions regarding how to eat food. Things like washing the hands, things like eating with your hand, things like chewing the food 40 times. Many of these things, we don't observe them. We're taught that it's all about, you know, as quick as possible, get over with it and get on to like what's really going to make you successful. But the reality is that all these things have, you know, they correspond with the real needs of the body for health, for spirituality. That food goes into the mouth and then it goes down the esophagus, you know, down the throat. At that point, it starts to get processed and turned into a type of paste when it gets in the stomach. And when it gets into the stomach, what happens at that point? It sits there. Subhanallah, it sits there for at least 20 minutes, more even depending on the type of food. And what happens, it's kind of like, you know, a sprinkler system, right? Where it's sort of spraying these things onto the food, these chemicals, in order to break it down. We're not even aware that this is happening. Now, you gotta, now this must be powerful chemicals, right? Because they're breaking down the likes of kebabs and you know, whatever. Not, I mean, it's pretty powerful stuff. So that means that it would break down our stomach as well, right? I mean, because after all, it's very powerful. But somehow, you know, the, the mucus that's emitted is enough to protect our stomach lining from being digested and corroded by the very chemicals that go and break down the food itself. And then it goes from there to the small intestine and somehow, you know, the goodness is taken out of it and, and all these things, they happen all the time. And what do we do? And we're like, yeah, man, that was good food. Let's go on. Okay, that's it. Right? You look at the Ahlul Bayt, they teach us that even when it comes to the process of taking out those things which are negative to the body, that requires a praise and a thanks as well. There's a special dua for that. All praise belongs to Allah. Abqa fi jasadi quwwatahu wa akhraja minni adahu. All praise belongs to Allah who keeps in my body that which is good for it and that which provides strength to it and takes out the thing which causes it harm. Why? Because they wanted us to realize that this thing is from God. Now what happens is that this process is in place, right, of 
where Allah has created us with needs. Those needs exist in the creation. We have an attraction to them. There's a means and tools for us be, to be able to attract that to us. Once we get it, we know how to then make use of it. But it's not just about that. There's a whole other system by which we attract rizq to ourselves and attain success that doesn't even have to do with us. And this is where we have to think about it. Have you ever noticed how there's some people who they seem to have everything, right? They're strong, they're healthy, they're intelligent, they go to good schools, good college, good universities, and what happens? They don't tend to be that successful in a material sense. And you have other people who, you know, they, you wouldn't think that they are where they are, but suddenly you find them very rich. You know, they seem like a golden, I don't know what they say, the golden thumb or whatever, they have an expression for it, silver spoon, I don't know, something like that. Where whatever they do, whatever they touch, right, it's like gold. Why does that happen? When we think about that, what are we supposed to realize? Like, let's say you were Qarun. Are we supposed to think and look at that and say that, oh, I'm Qarun, let's say, okay, that, oh, it's because I'm smart. What about the other people who are even more intelligent than you, but they didn't get the risk that you did? What does that mean? That means that in parallel to this system which we can see happening around us, there's certain things that we have to do in order to get our risk, and we have to do those things. I'm not saying that we don't do them. It's important for us to strive hard. One laysa lil insan illa ma sa'a. Human beings only get that which they strive. We need to strive. We need to make use of those apparent and outer means. But alongside, there's a whole system of esoteric and hidden means which provide us with our rizq. And one of the tests of human beings is to realize that whether you're successful or whether you're a failure, it's not in your hands. Because sometimes you take all the right steps on the outer level, but the inner causes come together to prevent you from getting what your heart desires. Why? For you to realize that it's not even in your hands. And sometimes it's the other way around. You know, recently you saw one of the famous actors that just came in the news like last week or something. He's a celebrity, right? He's, they caught him working at like a local grocery store, right? And it became like a big internet sensation Look, this guy, you know, now, and, now, and they had a fund for him to support him and all that because they like, how can somebody who was a famous actor now like this, right? And then you have other you know, actors who were famous at one time and then they go on to like start their own companies, they become billionaires. Right? These are things for us to ponder and realize that success is not a one-dimensional thing, that you do these things and it's all about you. No. From the very need that has been created in you to your recognition of that need, to the thing that fulfills it, to the means to be able to achieve that, to the internal... Uh, systems that help you process that to the unseen processes that are in place which determine whether we're going to actually get what we want or not all of that's not about you it's all about him and you see brothers and sisters when we start to think in this way we start to realize that all these things about the dunya they're there to teach us a lesson not for us to become obsessed with it what we start to become obsessed with then is more about am I doing my responsibility to be able to achieve those things that Allah wants me to. Whether I get that ultimate you know, success the way they define it or not is not important to me. I'm not going to get overly caught up with that sort of thing because that's not my responsibility. It's not even in my hands. What I need to do is I need to do my responsibility. And then I need to focus on what's beyond that. These types of realizations are Tawhidi realization, this is part of the Akhira. This is part of the dimension of existence that we're living in right now, which goes beyond the material world. So now I want to move into the second part, the second part of two of my speech tonight, which is discussing this idea that how can we ensure that we have a proper interaction with the dunya, that we don't get caught up into it, that we remember these things. They remember that this is all a means to be able to arrive at a greater realization. And so what I'd like to say that according to the teachings of the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt one of the main ways of being able to do so is the Salah. You know, why is it that sometimes you know, we talk about Salah, people say, oh come on man, we've heard of that like hundreds of times, right? We are at a majlis for Imam Hussain Imam Hussain on the 
ninth day of Muharram, when the enemy army was coming to attack, you know, he says to his brother, Abu al-Fadl, says that go and delay this, and he gives some reasons. One of them is because um, Allah knows that inni uhibbu as-salah. I love salah. So one of the least things that we can do on such a night is to commit ourselves to loving those things that Imam Hussein loves. And to understand how this is such a powerful means for being able to take us away from the worship of the idol of self. Inshallah, um, with, a salawat and some, uh, with a salawat, I can inshallah explain further. <coughs> Allah Ta'ala has prescribed salah to us and He does so as a way to be able to pry us away from the dunya, to make us focus on what really matters. Right at that time in the morning where you know, our sleep is very profound, very, very satisfying, Allah says, wake up. Right in the middle of the day when we're in the midst of transactions and business calls and selling this thing and working on this thing, stop everything, go and attend to your salah. In the evening when we'd like to kind of kick back, you know, turn on the TV, you know, spend time with the family, no, get up, even if it's in the middle, go, do your salah. These are things that we need to think about. There's a program in place here where Allah knows our nature and He knows that if we're not careful, then we're going to get sucked into this dunya. But what happens, brothers and sisters, is that especially for mu'mineen, Sometimes what happens is they, they don't see that necessary benefit from the salah. They're praying and they're not finding it to be a means of helping them get closer to Allah. What's happening here? What I'd like to do tonight, inshallah, is to explain some of these reasons. Now the first point is this, is that sometimes what happens is that we engage in ibadah. We do things that we're asked to, but at the same time, we're also sinning as well. You know, we have our certain things that we allow ourselves, we give ourselves permission to kind of indulge. Now, I'm not talking about those things but sometimes somebody does out of ghafla, out of unawareness, heedlessness, and then they go and repent. Now, I'm talking about those things that we actually decide. We say, this is something I'm okay with. I know that God is, but I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm going to allow myself this thing. One of the effects of sins, brothers and sisters, is that sins blind us to the reality behind the dunya. Meaning the reality... Um, above and beyond the dunya. Okay, where's that coming from? Is that something that I'm saying? No, this is what we find in the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim um, wasalam. There's a very beautiful hadith of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. If you can say salawat, please. He says in a tradition, he says that man raqahu zibrij dunya a'aqaba nadhirayhi it's a very beautiful, profound hadith. He says that whoever um, becomes attracted to the glitter of the dunya, right, there's something that catches their eye. It's something they shouldn't be uh, engaging with, shouldn't be looking, shouldn't be admiring it, but they do so. What happens? What is the effect of that? The, what, what they inherit from that, what they, what, what the, the product of that is that their eyes become blind. What kind of blindness is that? Allah Ta'ala in the Qur'an describes a, a very beautiful point, it's a very deep tafsiri point, I'm just going to refer to it in passing, that he says that um, in a number of verses that he's given us these uh, means for being able to perceive reality. Our eyes, our ears, our hearts, our minds. Allah has in, uh, besto bestowed them upon us so that we can understand reality. But what happens is that if we misuse these tools, they become a source of blindness to us. And so, one of the reasons why our ibadah sometimes doesn't result in the conclusion is because it's accompanied with sin. Allah Ta'ala says in the Qur'an, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم This is Surah Taha. وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى The person who uh, turns away from my remembrance, meaning that they start to do things without looking at what Allah wants. Then Allah says that He's going to take away that risk from them. And um, on the day of judgment, they're going to be raised and they'll be blind. 
And they'll say, Rabbi, lima hasharatani a'ma wa qad kuntu basira. Oh my Lord, why is it that you have raised me and I am blind while I was seeing in the world? This is the way that the signs of God came to you and you forgot them. And today you are also going to be forgotten as well. You're going to be left alone. This is very severe, brothers and sisters. It's worth pondering upon. Now, on the other hand, when somebody is actively uh, obeying the command of Allah for Allah's sake, we talked about this yesterday. It was a key point. I hope, inshallah, I was able to convey that when we are performing, God, performing God's obligations and staying away from His prohibitions, we do so with an active intention. I'm looking away from that haram, not just out of habit, but because of Allah. And I'm, I'm paying attention to that. I'm doing this wajib, not just for that, because of Allah, I pay attention to it. What that results in is real knowledge of Allah Ta'ala. It takes us beyond the dunya. We have traditions, for example, from Imam As-Sadiq He says that the look which is haram is an arrow from the arrow of Iblis. It's poisoned. Whoever leaves it aside for the sake of Allah, not for the sake of anybody else, right? not because somebody else is watching, or not because of habit, or not just because I'm just, no, I do it for the sake of Allah. What happens then? أَقَبَهُ اللَّهُ إِيمَانًا يَجِدُ طَعْمَهُ Allah causes him to get the a result of iman. They feel that spirituality. They sense it. They, can, they, they have that awareness beyond the dunya. They realize that there's more out there. It's very beautiful. Right? Sometimes it's not, you know, we don't need to look too far to see how we can be able to escape from the dunya. It's right there in front of us. Very simple things that we have to be aware of. That's point number one. Point number two, brothers and sisters, is that when it comes to our salah, if we want it to be truly effective, we have to learn how to do the salah for the sake of Allah, out of ikhlas. Now normally, you know, ikhlas is translated as sincerity or purity. And normally when we talk about purity, we talk about it to mean the purity of intention. And we say that one of those things which makes our salah batil is if we were to do it for the sake of somebody else. I'm praying right now because I know that my friend is there and he'll tell others if I don't pray so that I pray. Or something of that sort. And that's something, of course, which is important. We should be praying for the sake of Allah. But brothers and sisters, there is another level or another dimension to ikhlas which is often not talked about. And this point is a key point from the lecture tonight. For myself, it was a key sort of point of like, you know, realization. Inshallah, I hope I can convey it to you. Brothers and sisters, there's one time when you pray for the sake of some other, somebody else. Of course, that makes your ibadah batil. And that's something where the prayer will not lift you in any way. But is it possible, brothers and sisters, where we don't pray for the sake of somebody else, but we also don't pray for the sake of Allah? Have you thought about this? So it's not because of somebody, not for the sake of Allah. So who is it for? It's for myself. I'm praying for myself. How can that be the case? Now look at your own experience, brothers and sisters. When you pray, why do you pray? Okay, how, do I, how can I figure that out? Okay, let me ask you this question. Once you're done with your prayer, why are you happy? Right? What sort of makes like, oh yeah, okay, good. why? Is it the case that I'm happy because I knew I needed to pray? I prayed, now I'm done. Or am I happy because I know that Allah is happy with me? There's a fundamental difference. When I stand for prayer, am I praying because I know that Allah has asked me to pray? Or am I praying because... I know I need to pray, and so I'm used to praying. I do this, this is what I do, so I'm going to pray. This isn't coming from me. It's coming from the tradition of Imam Sadiq, alayhi salam. Say salawat, please. He says that um, when you want to judge somebody, he says that don't you know, be fooled by somebody's salah or their salam. Right? If you want to judge somebody, look and... Because he said that what happens is that people sometimes they get used to doing something and if they don't do it, they kind of feel you know, kind of disconcerted. It, they, they feel kind of separated from the routine. But what you should be looking at is how truthful they are and how 
well they give their amanat, meaning how trustworthy they are. So the next question is this, brothers and sisters. Okay, our salah is not giving us effect, it's not giving us the effect that we desire. While we're doing that salah, how are we when it comes to the other things that Allah has asked us to do? For example, when it comes to our family, we're doing salah regularly, you know, maybe even doing it awal al waqt maybe we're even doing salat al-layl. But how are we treating our spouses? Do we have that respect or do we you know, constantly try to kind of find a way to bring them down? How do we treat our children? Do we treat them with respect? Or are we always on their case and criticizing them? When it comes to those rights and responsibilities that we have, whether it be our spouses, our children, our parents, or whether it be mu'mineen, are we observing them? Many times the people whose salah is not effective, they're performing it. The problem is that when it comes to the other obligations, they're not doing those. Now what's the problem with that? And this is a key point here. The problem with it is this, that if it's the case that the reason why I'm praying is Allah, that means that that same Allah is the one who's asking me to do the other things as well. So if I'm truly worshiping Allah, then the same seriousness and the same passion with which I'm going to pray, I should be doing these other things as well. I should be able to hold my tongue in, in, and, and forgive and hold back being spiteful and ridiculing and sarcasm when I need to. But if I can't do that, what that means is in reality, I have two lords. I have two gods that I'm obeying. There's one God that I obey, obey for my salah and my psalm and my Quran and my going to mosque and all that. And there's another God that I obey when it comes to, let's say, you know, the social relationships that I have with my family. And so what am I doing? I have multiple idols that I've set up for myself. So you see, brothers and sisters, if we want to have our salah truly be effective, what well, we need to ask ourselves is this question that why am I praying? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Some of you have children and or some of you inshallah in the future you'll be having children or you have grandchildren or you know it's one thing that you're working with children, you're doing tarbiyah. And sometimes we wonder about this, that how can we teach our children about the importance of ibadah? From nine years old, actually from eight years and eight months old, according to the solemn calendar, the girls, it's an obligation to pray. You know, for boys, it's also not too much after that, right? It's something which is very serious. How can we get them to fast? How can we get them to pray? These sorts of things. Sometimes the approach that we take is sort of, maybe we can think about that as well and relate it to this point right here. There's one time, for example, when people say that, okay, well, you have to pray because if you don't pray, then, okay, you're going to roast in hell. Okay, well, that's an approach, okay, and, you know, could, is, it, is it wrong? No. I mean, is it, is, it, is it false? No. But maybe that's not the only approach or the best approach that we're going to take when it comes to explaining ibadah. There's another approach that we take sometimes where we say that, okay, well, you have to fast. Why do you fast? Okay, I fast because, um, well, it's healthy for you. Like, why do you pray? Uh, we pray because, you know, it's kind of like yoga, right? You know, you go and you do the motions, you're doing the stretching and all that. You wake up in the morning, it's the healthiest time to be awake. So we kind of try to justify it, when it through dunyawi sort of things. And, and that's not completely wrong. You know, we do have some ahadith, for example, which tell us that these are some of the secrets of the ibadah. Sometimes, you know, when it comes to justifying and, and talking about the acts of worship, right, we really want to um, ask this question of why we do what we do. Well, we can take this approach, which is that the reason why we fast, the reason why we pray is because Allah has asked us to. Because of our love for Him, because we know what He's done to us and what He's done for us, and He's asking us to pray, that's why we have to pray. And I would encourage the parents here, you try that out. And you see what happens. You yourself practice that. When you stand for prayer, the reason why you pray is because Allah has asked you to. And you see what type of effect it's going to have, what kind of profound effects you're going to see in your life. And then when you go to your children and you wake them up at 3 o'clock in the morning for doing their suhoor or you know, doing their prayers, and you're like, how is this, what's going to happen? And you, what you do is you go to them gently and you tell them that my son, my daughter, Allah wants you to pray. 
Get up, let's pray, and then you can go back to sleep. Then you'll see what happens. What kind of magic transform? You see that somehow these children, when they realize what Allah has done for them, and they know that Allah is asking them this, then they don't need any other reasons. Sometimes we make it too hard for ourselves. We go to all the no. Allah wants this from okay. This is what I want. I'm, I'm gonna do it. The key thing, brothers and sisters, is that we have to accept this for ourselves. What kind of source of regret would it be on the day of judgment? Where we see all these, this time that we spent, you know, going to the centers and standing for prayer and doing a'mal and uh, fasting and all these troubles that we took and we see that it didn't amount to anything in terms of giving us knowledge about anything beyond the dunya. We just kind of slaved through it and it was f for nothing but ourselves so that we would just feel a sort of contentment. That, okay, I'm done with that. Now I can move on to what's more important. It's amazing when you go to what the Ahlul Bayt and what Allah expected us and how they expected us to treat Salah. It's supposed to be you know, the most delightful opportunity for us to be in full attention to the one that we really worship, not in attention to ourselves. I'll give you one example from the Ahadith. This is from our sixth Imam, salam. He says that when the servant if إِذَا قَامَ الْعَبْدُ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ When the servant stands for salah. أَقْبَلَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ عَلَيْهِ بِوَجْهِهِ Imagine that, you know, somebody who is, you know, like somebody who is famous, somebody who is popular, right? They, you find out that they know about you. Right? They know your name, they know who you are. They know something about you. Right? You kind of start to feel honored about it, right? Here, Imam Sadiq is saying that when the servant stands for prayer, Allah Azza wa Jalla turns to his servant with his face, meaning that Allah is giving him full attention. But isn't that itself something which is just like, subhanAllah, Allah is turning to me in attention. Wow. Okay, I'm praying to him. Now what happens? فَلَا يَزَالُ مُقْبِلًا عَلَيْهِ Allah will continue to pay attention to him in that same full rapture, full attention until that servant turns away from Allah three times. And when he turns away from him third, three times, Allah turns away from him as well too. Brothers and sisters, in our salah, where is our heart? Is it on ourselves or is it on Allah Ta'ala? If we start to switch the simple thing of like, I'm praying not for myself or to show off to somebody or to check a list, something in a checklist, I'm praying for the sake of Allah. And that becomes, you know, the purpose for why we do our actions and we actively pay attention to it, then we're going to start seeing some differences. We're going to start seeing our prayer be a source of elevation for us. And this is something that we can apply to other actions in our life as well too, brothers and sisters when it comes to the other obligations we perform. Even when it comes to the smile that I have for my children when I come home even though I'm tired. Even if it comes to that extra sacrifice and the forgiveness I show to my spouse for the sake of Allah. When I do that for His sake, then my life starts to take on a different color. As I go through these different things, and when I, at the end of the day I look back at my actions, I see that this was a day where all these things happened and all of them were for his sake. What higher pleasure could a servant derive other than that? We ask Allah Ta'ala to count us among the musalleen, those whose actions of ibadah truly were actions that took them away from the dunya and towards Allah Ta'ala. The last point I'll mention for tonight just as a segue for the masaib and a means for our hearts to inshallah open up um, for the remembrance of Abu Abdullah al Hussein and the Shuhada of Karbala. It's a small story, a very inspiring story, to help us understand and appreciate the value of the love of the Ahlul Bayt. You know, we're talking about how the dunya, you can get immersed in it, you can see yourself as the means for everything, you can make it be the measure for your success. But when we look at Somebody who has the love of the Ahlul Bayt that love is something which is priceless. We need to use that, brothers and sisters, as a way of escaping 
the clutches of the dunya, escaping the idol of self. There was a man who was very poor, struggling. He goes to Imam As-Sadiq and he starts to explain to him all the troubles that he's having. The Imam A.S. looks at him and says that you are not poor. He says that I, it seems like maybe you're not aware of my situation. He starts to explain that I have some debts here, I have this going on here, my job isn't working out, my company, whatever, all these things. The Imam says, no, you're not poor. He said the house, so the Imam A.S. says that, okay, I have a question for you. Would you be willing to sell the acceptance of the wilaya of the Ahlul Bayt from your heart for a hundred dinars? He says that, uh, of course not. He says, what about if I were to give you, for example, 200 dinars, would you sell that? You know, would you kind of do that sort of exchange? No. And the Imam Islam starts to up the number, up the number, thousands of dinars. Would you be willing to give it? A fortune, would you, a fortune in money, would you be willing to give it up for the acceptance of the wilaya and the love of the Ahlul Bayt He says that no. So he says somebody who has something that is more priceless than thousands of dinars and anything that's found on the material world, then how could that person see themselves as being somebody who is poor? We thank Allah Ta'ala for this opportunity and this honor of being the lovers of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa sallam.